Well, I'm glad to have my friend uh, Shannon Bream here on the Way Home Podcast. Shannon, uh, thank you for joining me again. I, I really on uh, to talk uh, about your books and about a whole lot of things. About life. And thank you so much yeah. for having me back. It's a treat. So uh, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about your books. I think people know you, uh, obviously, as a journalist on Fox. Uh, you've been a journalist there for a long time. And... Uh, but you are also an author and uh, your last couple of books, uh, the one that came out last year and one that uh, just released uh, really have, have uh, caught fire and kind of expect that. Uh, the two books are uh, Women of the, the Bible Speak and then uh, the most recent, The Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak. So Shannon, talk to us a little bit. You're a journalist, you're covering hard news, Covering you covered Supreme Court for a long, sort of in the thick of journalism and politics in D.C. Uh, but you also have this other side of you that really likes to write about characters of the Bible. So, talk about the inspiration for these books. What what really was moving in your heart to say? I want to I want to write a couple books about. You know, Fox actually initially came to me with this idea a couple of years ago and said, we're thinking about doing a few books under a Fox News book label, and we know faith is important to you, and we're interested in doing something with women and religion and the Bible and faith. And I was thrilled. I mean, it was just one of those things that um, I thought maybe one day I would do when I had time. You know how it is. Um, and then you just start cramming a lot of things into life at once, and somehow God works and provides helpers and you get things done. And as I dug into these stories, you know, I grew up in a Christian home, K through 12 Christian school, Liberty undergrad. So I had a lot of theological um, information and wisdom poured into me over the years by great teachers and pastors. Um, but when I really started to dig into these stories for myself and really study these women, um, learn more. I mean, I've never been to seminary. I would love to do that maybe one day. But to talk to people to get information about what does this mean in Greek or Hebrew? What was the cultural context of the day for this particular woman? I just learned so much more. And their stories are so rich in so many twists and turns. Um, and they're all flawed in some way, which I think gives us a lot of hope that God can work through our messes right. and our flaws. And I just felt like I really got to know these women. And I, personally, that was a gift to me. I really hope that the readers will feel that way too. You know, there's something really cool about studying uh characters you know i've always loved character profile i remember growing up listening to pastors like chucks do these great character profiles you know i listen on the radio moses and it's like man this is this is really cool and then you know writing the the character books that i've done it's just so much fun to kind of put yourself um uh, I, I think we think of these folks in the bible as these people but really, they were just ordinary people that were part of the story that God was telling uh, in Jesus. Uh, what did you learn when you studied these characters? What surprised you? You, you know, you you talked about having grown up in the church and you know a lot of the Bible. But was there anything that surprised you when you started really research the characters? I got to say, the one who surprised me the most because they all had their little surprises. But was Bathsheba? I mean, I had the wrong impression. I mean, growing up, I don't know if I, it was my impression or a, somewhere along the, the line, the story in my mind had become that she was at fault. She was this seductress who was purposely trying to catch King David's eye um, when she was out bathing herself. But the scripture does not say that. Um, and when you read about that story, you realize that the men were away at war. Bathsheba's husband was away. And David, the king, should have been with them. He stayed home. I mean, he's the one who was walking around on his rooftop, happened to see her. And not only that, when he inquired about her, he was told exactly who she was, um, who her father was, and that her husband, she had a husband, his name was Uriah. And he still sent for her and called her to the palace. So we're told nothing about their relationship, about whether she was happy to be there, whether she went because she was fearful there was news about Uriah. We don't know anything other than they were together, they were intimate, and he sent her home. And she eventually figured out she was pregnant, which launched these horrific, terrible decisions um, that were uh, domino after domino of sin and of destruction. But what I also forgot about Bathsheba is that she was the mother of King Solomon. So if you keep reading her story, um, she is key and, and a central figure in helping him ascend to the throne. And he has great reverence for her. And of course, we know him as um, the wisest man to live is the title he's often given. 
in that when God said, what do you want? Instead of asking for fame or fortune or riches or any of those things, what he said was that he wanted discernment to be able to lead the people and to have wisdom. And God said, because you didn't ask, I'm going to give you that plus all those things you didn't ask for. So she had a uh, mothering instincts that that brought up someone like King Solomon and was was key at the part of his life when he ascended to, his, to the, the throne. And he even set up a throne for her. I mean, so she was sort of this queen mother figure. So mm. there's so much more than that initial exchange between her and David decades before that. And I really learned a different perspective on who was probably at fault in that decision. Such a great, uh, great word. I mean, uh, when you read the Bible, when you read that part of the Old Testament, um, you know, most judgment, most of God's God being upset was really with Dave. Think of Nathan. It really doesn't come down that hard on Bathsheba. And if you really read it, it does in some ways she was kind of exploited because, you know, if the king summons you, you know, you you almost have to come. And so I'm I'm glad that you highlight it's interesting to think of her years while Solomon is king. I haven't as sort of a, an advisor, a queen mother. She is also mentioned, which is so cool. She's mentioned in the genealogy in Matthew, you know, of, you know, uh, Matthew saying, here's the new king. Uh, her being mentioned in there, it was, was, was um, not common that women would be mentioned, especially someone with her story. So I, I love that you, you brought that out um, this, your first book was um, talking about women of the Bible, which is really, really great. This one is uh, mothers and daughters. And uh, what, what's interesting is I don't know that people, all those mother-daughter relationships that you see in scripture. Was that uh, pretty cool to uncover those? Yeah, I really like digging into those. We also do mothers and sons and fathers and daughters. So there are different combinations of mothers and daughters all throughout the book. And we also looked at the idea of spiritual motherhood and daughterhood, sort of mm. those mentorship uh, relationships that you have. And I think those are so important, only not only that God included them in God's word for us to read, but I think it's also signaling to us how important those relationships can be in our lives now. And in one of those in particular, I, I really dig into Naomi and Ruth because I think it's one of the most beautiful stories uh, about um, just tragedy binding these two women together. They weren't bound by blood, but by marriage and by tragedy when they both were widowed, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, and decided to stick together as much as Naomi tried to turn away her two daughters-in-law to say, you're young, you can still have families and go on with your life. There's no reason for you to waste your life with me. But Ruth was the one who refused to leave her. And that passage that's so often used in weddings, entreat me not to leave you wherever you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Those were big statements. I mean, Ruth was leaving behind her homeland and the small G gods that would have been uh, important to her, her cultural uh, faith and family. And she was going all in with Naomi to go back to where Naomi was from, back to the, the Jewish people. And um, Ruth, because of her faithfulness, uh, also ends up in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And such a beautiful story about how the two women are thrown into a situation where with no male provider at that time, financially would have been dire for them, probably living in poverty and no male protector either as they went on a difficult journey home and then really lived on the margins. They're just trying to, you know, Ruth going out, trying to gather from the fields, whatever the gleaners left behind. But mm -hmm. Boaz saw her faithfulness and really honored and esteemed her for her commitment to Naomi, to her mother-in-law, that she really didn't have any kind of legal or ethical obligation to. Um, but in that, he ends up, um, he and Ruth obviously falling in love and being in that in lineage to Christ. And there's great redemption for Naomi at the end, too, and for Ruth. And just a beautiful picture of making the decision to stick together with someone in a very difficult period and honoring that. Um, I think God honored it, too. Hmm. I, I, I love uh, you uncovering that because I think, you know, it's easy to read those passages and not really the weight of what they were enduring. Um, both of them lost their husbands. You know, think of Naomi. Sometimes we harshly judge her because she um, she has that sequence where she basically blames circumstances. But when you actually look, read that, at least she's acknowledging that it came from God. You know, she didn't turn away to turn to false idols. And just to understand the the hardship they went through. Here are people who are living on the edge. No support. This is before you had social safety net right. that could kind of 
uh, uplift people and to see that great faith. I, I love that you've done that. I think sometimes, Shannon, I don't know if you feel this way. Sometimes when we think about the heroes of the faith, in we typically think of the men, and, and obviously there are these great men, you know, Abraham and uh, uh, David and and uh, all, you know, Paul and the, the disciples, but we don't always think of the women that were that were the, had to exhibit great faith. And so I'm glad that you you really uncovered that. I think about this, you know, I have three daughters. For them to be able to read this and say, okay, I could see myself in the characters of the Bible. Is that one of the reasons you you wrote that? Yeah, and I think too that when you look over time, the women I write about are centuries ago, but they had very modern day problems. I mean, dysfunctional families and you mm. know, backstabbing and financial ruin, physical uh, devastation, infertility, widowhood, any number of things that are very much universal across time. And I found that in looking at their stories, gosh, there are pegs to today that every woman reading these books is going to see something hopefully that they personally identify with. Oh, I've had a struggle, maybe not this exact one, maybe this exact one, but I've been through a period of feeling like God's not there, of waiting, of having to learn patience sort of in the mm. silence or really struggling and finding that he was the only lifeline uh, that I had in those darkest valleys and toughest moments. So. I think maybe that's why people have connected with these books so much, why women have and taken them up as Bible studies or book clubs is because there are those universal themes of suffering and waiting and frustration um, and all of those things that, listen, if God only puts unflawed characters in the Bible, it would be Jesus, the end, that would be it. But <laughs> right, the short book. I find that comforting because he includes all these messy families mm. and people who made bad decisions. And that he's able to show how he worked good through that. And some of it, I think we will not see this side of eternity. Some of those real pains and frustrations, they won't make sense here. But we know that he has a greater plan. And I think in looking at these stories over the centuries, we can see often how he was working and why those periods of waiting were there or the no answer was there. Um, and hopefully that that gives women and men who pick up these books uh, encouragement for today that God is very aware of your story and working through every bit of your circumstances. That's such a good word. You know, I think we think it's just a set of propositions, and it is, and a set of doctrines, and, and it is that clearly. But it's, it's also a lot of narratives, a lot of stories uh, that we uh, can resonate with. There's a couple of relationships here that you explore that I think are really interesting and cool. I mean, one, about Mary from two different perspectives, Mary and her relationship with Elizabeth, and then Mary and her relationship with Jesus as her son. I'd, I'd love for you to share a little bit about what you learned in those two. Yeah, with Elizabeth and Mary, I love, again, that it's that picture of women who are not mother and daughter, but they were cousins. Elizabeth was much older than Mary, but they're sort mm. of united in this spiritual mentorship or motherhood and daughterhood because of their circumstances. When we meet Elizabeth, she's married to Zachariah. Uh, Luke writes about their story, and he's a very specific writer, and he says... They were living by the commandments, by the law, upholding everything that God expected of them. They both were through priestly lineages. And Zechariah was actually um, on his assignment to go to the temple. They would have two periods, one week uh, each, a year. And they would go to the temple. And at this point, when we're introduced to their story, Israel has heard nothing for 400 years. I mean, there's been nothing from God or from direction to them. And I got to think, okay, these priests are still showing up at the temple and doing everything they're supposed to do. Zachariah is among them. He gets chosen by lot, and I'm sure that is not uh, by coincidence, to go in and do this offering of incense. You could go your whole life as a priest and never, ever have a chance to do that because there were thousands of them. But he gets chosen, and he, we learned that he and Elizabeth are barren. They've never had children and wanted children. And while he's in there, the angel Gabriel shows up. So after 400 years of silence, you're in doing your duty. A, a Somebody like Gabriel, a, a being like a Gabriel shows up and says, um, you're going to have a baby. God heard your answers. Elizabeth is going to give birth to the son. He winds up, he's going to be John the Baptist and he'll be this precursor in bringing and introducing Jesus and his ministry here on earth. And Zachariah is so doubtful um, that he really asks some questions. And, and Gabriel says, I am Gabriel. I have just come from the throne of heaven. And I'm telling you the truth about this, but because you haven't believed, you're going to be mute. So the people outside are wondering what's happening, what's happening. He finally comes out. And I think about this crazy charade that he has to try to explain to them, like, 
there was an angel, I'm flapping my wings, there's gonna be a baby, like try to explain this whole thing. He goes home and then has to explain it to Elizabeth. And so she finds out she's gonna have a baby and very abruptly, like in the next verse, it says she's pregnant, she's having this baby. So we see a little bit later that Gabriel visits uh, Mary, this much younger woman, her cousin, and surprises her with a pregnancy. So both of these women now have pregnancies completely unexpected, much later than you would have hoped for and much sooner than Mary would have expected. But I love that Gabriel tells Mary, by the way, your cousin Elizabeth is also pregnant. And to watch how she then runs to Mary or run, Mary runs to Elizabeth and how there's this recognition as Elizabeth says, you know, baby John is leaping in her womb and she's now filled with the Holy Spirit and is able to testify and sort of prophesy over Mary. And Mary hasn't told her about the pregnancy, but she immediately speaks of it. You're going to be the mother of our Lord. And just what a relationship that God gave them to each other in that time and space to share something that I'm sure a lot of people around them would not have understood or believed their explanations, but they had each other in that moment. And so God's timing is never a mistake. All those decades probably that Elizabeth waited, um, I love that they then had that experience of walking through that together. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love the way you talk about that. And I think about Mary and her son. I talked, I uh, explored that a little bit in, in my character's Christmas book, but you know, she obviously understood the promise that, this baby would God who would um, save her sins and save the sins of, but it's also her son, her, you know, um, and she, we forget that she had to watch all sufferings that he had to endure as, you know, his family's rejecting him. He's being mocked. That's hard for a mother to watch and to just agonize with that. And then she's there at the foot of the cross as he's beaten beyond recognition and, you know, just I, I don't think we quite recognize she gave and endured uh, as part of uh, God's plan of redemption. Um, so I, I, I'm glad that you explored Mary in that way. Yeah. And, you know, I was so struck by the fact, too, that um, I include earlier in their story where, um, you know, God comes to Joseph in a dream and says, King Herod, this bad, evil ruler is going to want to kill little Jesus. You got to go right now. No warning. And they pick up and go to a completely strange land, winding up mm. in Egypt. And I just have been so struck by that passage that obviously I wrote, um, you know, about her and thinking about women on the run and refugees and people mm. desperately in need of help before we knew the horrors that would unfold in Ukraine. But I just was so reminded when I would see these mothers bravely mm. leaving these men who bravely stayed behind to fight. Um, and just trying to get to the nearest safe place with all of their children and whatever they could grab. Sometimes it's crossing a border into Poland or somewhere else. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just trying to get to the western part of the country. Um, but I'm so amazed by these mothers and inspired by them and the bravery and the courage and just stepping up in what they have to do in that moment. And I think Joseph and Mary knew what it was like to be refugees on the run, trying to protect your mm -hmm. child and ending up in a strange land, probably with no family or friends. And that's what we're seeing play out in real time. And just as God was aware and involved in that struggle and that journey centuries ago, I believe that he sees every minute of what is happening in Ukraine and places around the world that are suffering oppression. That is one that we see, it's devastating, it's in the headlines a lot, but there are places, you know, all over the globe where there are people who find themselves in very dangerous situations as a matter of just daily existence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not all the stories in the Bible, as, as you outlined, are, I mean, they're gritty. A lot of them are gritty and hard. Uh, you talk about Bathsheba and, and the difficulty she had. Um, you profile uh, Dinah, who, you know, had a built situation. And, and again, that's, I think that's what's great about this is that, you know, the Bible is not just a story of endless happiness, but it's real people going through real struggles. Um, and in some way about this, as I'm listening to you talking, I mean, you, you are a journal, journal students, you tell stories, you uncover stories. So in some ways, what you're doing here with these characters is, is not that different than what you do in your, uh, everyday life, isn't it? Yeah, you're right. I mean, the thing about these stories is they already exist. They're there. God's word is full of the facts and the information, mm -hmm. and we can look to other things to sort of fill out 
what was happening in that time period and give us some other context for these stories. And I love to research. It's probably the best thing I learned from law school and my years as an attorney mm. was research. And I think it's so important in journalism, but in writing these books too, I really, I'm like, if I could go back to school, I would, I love homework and I love prep. And that's, mm. you know, why I think I love my job so much. Cause I'm always learning new things about parts of the world and people and conflicts and um, science and medicine. I mean, there's always something to learn. So yeah, I love the research aspect. I always wish you probably did as do too as an author that you have more time. Mm. Um, but um, when I'm in the thick of it and I have to sort of, when I am writing, um, just other than work, I can't really do anything else. And so I feel like I'm with these women and walking with them and getting to know them. And um, I love to go watch other Bible teachers and sermons and Catholic priests and Jewish rabbis and listen to their sermons and their studies. And it, it always gives me a new richness and, and more angles of understanding for these women. Um, but then to just tell their stories, I feel like it, it is a lot like news reporting in that those stories are already there. I'm just putting them together, hopefully in a format that is uh, enjoyable and informative to whether it's the viewer or the reader. And um, I love that maybe some people who wouldn't want to pick up the Bible and start flipping through, mm -hmm. you know, for Kings or for Samuel um, would feel more comfortable picking up this book or sharing it with somebody who um, says, I'm not a biblical scholar. I can't jump in and understand this stuff. Uh, hopefully it's it's been put together in a way that um, people will find very relatable. Absolutely. Have you always liked to write? Do you enjoy writing? Something that that um, you talked about going through law school. I mean, being a journalist and a lawyer, there's a lot of writing there. <laughs> Have you, is that something you've always enjoyed? Um, I, I don't wanna lie, uh, cause no, <laughs> but <laughs> when I was forced to in law school, the thing that was so funny is up to that point, every term paper or thesis or anything that you're putting together, you gotta get to 20 pages, 30 pages, 50 pages, whatever it is. And you're like, all right, how do I fill this? So it's still interesting and informative but I got a lot to fill. Whereas what happened to me in law school and in my practice of law is like this brief can't be more than X pages. You only get mm. this many words and you're really trying to make your argument. So it forces you to be more concise and specific in your writing. Um, it doesn't leave uh, room for flourishes or creativity. Although, you know, when mm. judges write a good opinion and you can see the skill that they have with words and they can take as many pages as they want. So mm -hmm. um, there are all different kinds of writing and I never thought I was a fantastic writer, but I think the more you do it, um, certainly with anything you hope that you get better, I've become much quicker in turning out a script. I can remember as a young reporter, I would think all day like, okay, how's it gonna start? How's it gonna end? Where, what's gonna be the middle? What's gonna be the best sound bite? Um, what's my deadline? And then you are forced to do it multiple times a day um, to where, you know, you're already thinking a script in your head when you're thinking about the story or interviewing someone. You're like, yep, I can hear that goes here. That's my closing line. That's my opening line. So I think you just um, there becomes an economy of, of how you put things together. But I'm always hoping to get better. I do enjoy the researching and writing process um, more the older I get. And I think the more experience I have with it. Mm. For sure. Well, these are these are great. I know people are really enjoying uh, these. Um, I wanted to ask you too, how um, you you're uh, a Christian who's involved in politics. Um, how have you been able to stay grounded uh, in the midst of all this? You know, it feels like the world's gotten more more and more polarized. A lot of people are jaded and cynical. Avoided all that. Uh, in, and sort of kept your head above the water, especially the last few years uh, as a Christian working in, in this, this kind of world. And I guess part two of that would be what advice would you give to other who really want to do the kind of work you do, journalism? Uh, what, what would you say? For me, it's got to be a very specific choice every day that I'm going to be in the word, I'm going to be in prayer. That's going to be my priority mm. to set the day to kind of put on the armor. If we want to think about it that way, um, mm. because I really, it was a wake up call for me during COVID about how comfortable parts of my life had become. And not that it's wrong to find joy in certain things like going out to eat with your friends or any number of activities that you would just take for granted or, um, you know, whatever it was, I found, gosh, there were parts of my life that are just very comfortable. Now, when COVID uh, was sort of a wake up and ripped everything away, because with most stories, I could report on it. I could be moved. I could be bothered by something, disturbed by something, but get home, 
have my, um, you know, personal life and, and kind of try to compartmentalize those with COVID. None of us could turn off the story because we mm. all were the story and you were watching people um, or, or if it was yourself, I, you lose your job, um, lose your health, lose somebody that you loved, worry about your kids and this impact on them with school. And, you know, it was just every day I would wake up and there's another overnight note about markets crashing around the world or on the verge of that. I mean, there were just it was a wave after wave of bad news. And I thought, this is a reset and a reminder to me that none of these other things will ever protect or bring me joy eternally. We can have moments of joy. And I do think God provides us things in our life to um, to bring us happiness and to, um, to, for, to remind us of him. Um, but we can't ever value any of those gifts above the giver. And I had done that in some places in my life. And it was a real mm. reset. So for me... It's that daily choice to remember that um, there is eternity. Good is ultimately going to triumph over evil, but let's fill our, our hearts and our minds up with God's word and God's truth. Uh, for me, I like to journal as well and pray and read in the mm -hmm. morning um, so that I know what the truth is and that I am prepared for what the day brings. So that'd be my best advice. And I also was struck in writing both of these most recent books too about it's tough because I think we all have to think, do you want to win someone over or do you want to win the argument? We're all going to have people that we disagree with, but if we're really trying to win them to Christ, he's given us a great example. He went to people who clearly did not line up with his own um, morality or standards, but he went to them not to scream in their faces or to tell them you're going to go to hell right this minute. I mean, he was the son of God. He could have said anything that he wanted to say. And what he normally did with people is to say, you know, turn from your sin, but I don't condemn you. You know, I'm here to redeem people. There is truth and there is um, judgment, but I'm here to say to you face to face, whether it's the Samaritan woman who was living in shame and trying to hide her whole life, that he knew exactly when she would be at that well, that he would be there and have that conversation with her or the woman caught in adultery where he confronted everyone there. Okay, everybody without sin, you go first in casting the first stone. When nobody's left, he says, where are they? And she says, um, they've all gone. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Like go and sin no more, but I'm not here to destroy and decimate you. I'm here to lift you up and redeem you and give you true freedom. And so if we look at people and say, we're all created in God's image, I am a sinner saved by grace who needs forgiveness every day. How can I not then be merciful to others and show them love and kindness and truth, but do it in such a way that they're going to want to know more about God and about Christ, not be. Mm, I really like that. Um, you, when you report the news and more than someone like me, even though I pay attention to the news all the time, but man, like you're seeing bad news, awful images of human suffering around the world. Uh, I went to bed. I was just reading about Buka atrocities happening there or that happened there and just the depth of human evil. And you're, you're seeing that every day as a journalist. I think a lot of us, even if you're not journalists are seeing it across our timelines, but you, you're really up close as places and you've seen some of that stuff. How, I want to say, how has it affected your, your, as your, how has your Christian faith carried you at those moments? And what has it ever caused you to doubt and say, you know, uh, you know, doubt the goodness of God or doubt all that? Like, how, how does that work for you? I think that's probably the toughest question in our faith that I have internally and that I get externally from people too, is that how could God allow this level of suffering? The stories mm. that we hear and that we have to tell are, sickening. I mean, there's, they're just pure evil. There's really no mm. better descriptor for them. And it rips your heart out. And you think about, we're just watching it from a distance. Most of us, I've got colleagues who were there in the, in the region mm. now, and they're experiencing it at a totally different level, including, you know, the two that we lost in Benjamin Hall now, mm. uh, severely injured, but my goodness, it's amazing how positive this guy is in the midst of where mm. he's at and the long road he has of recovery, not just physically, but, you know, mentally and emotionally being there and watching our colleagues be killed and then fighting for his own life. It's tough. It is tough to disconnect. And I don't think we totally should. I think that we are empathetic beings. If anything, it just drives me into prayer on a more, even more regular basis. I love that there's nothing formal about it. 
I can stop in my office or in my car or on um, the metro subway mm -hmm. and have a thought about something or see these images and say, God, have mercy, please. We beg you for miracles of um, intervention for these people. But we know this world is evil and fallen, and it is not the ideal that he had set up for us. This is not something that he wanted for the human race. But there is the enemy who is, this is his territory, and he's wreaking havoc, and he's enjoying it. I think if anything, mm -hmm. it only deepens my faith. And, and I have had times in my life where I have doubts and questions, but I know God is bigger than all of that. He knows we're human, and I think he welcomes it, because how do we get to know him, that he exists, or to know him better? without asking really difficult questions about his existence and the way the world operates. Um, but I find the more I dig in that and in the darkest places of my life, he has shown up that it only becomes more um, comforting to me because I can't imagine walking through this life without something bigger and more comforting to know that there is good to come, that there is someone who is aware and who is actively involved in our lives and um, just completely aware of every one of these situations. And I know there are believers, we get um, videos we've had sent to us from missionaries mm. and from believers in that region who will show them um, in basements and subways singing hymns and encouraging each other. And, um, you know, going into dangerous places to try to help other people that are vulnerable. And it's like, my goodness, that is faith in action and how inspiring those people are to me. Mm. Yeah, the, the in, in places like Ukraine is just, uh, really, and, uh, you know, we obviously were, we're recording this like a week before Easter, you know, the Easter stories would give us hope, right. That, uh, Christ is coming to renew and restore and make all things new and fix everything broken. But, um, Shannon Bream, gr grateful for your, your work, your journalism. And I want to encourage folks, uh, to get these books, uh, uh, mothers and da mothers and daughters of the from nine biblical families is her latest, which is a great companion to the women of the Bible speak the wisdom of 16 women and their lessons for today. They're bestsellers. Couldn't happen to a better person. I want to encourage everyone to go get those books right now. Uh, Shannon, thanks for joining me today on the way home. Thank you. And what's your next book? I love yours too. You got to tell us what's coming. Well, I have one coming out in all the characters of creation. So I did the characters Christmas. I did the characters of Easter characters, creations coming out. And then, um, uh, I have a Bible study on the spiritual gifts from Lifeway coming out uh, this summer. And then I'm working right now. I'm almost finished with it uh, on a book on Christian unity. You know, Christians, as you know, are fighting like crazy and well, really think. grieves me. And I'm sure, I'm sure it grieves you too. And just like okay. really bother, bothers me. And so hopefully this could be a, a kind of a call to Christian unity. So I can't wait to read it. All of them. But, um, thank you for what you do as well and what you're putting out into the world. Well, thank you, Shannon. I appreciate it.